Babaji, we would like to ask you um, how it happened uh, for you after the death of uh, Master Kirpal. How and uh, why did you accept uh, Sanji as Master Kirpal's successor after his passing away and why not uh, somebody else? And uh, how was your relation with Sanji? How did you see him? It's very difficult to accept somebody as your master after, after you have had a very deep, powerful relation with the first master. Accepting master power was much easier because it just happened. I went to him, I had my best experience up to that point. It just happened spontaneously. My recognition, my acceptance was done. It just happened naturally. There was not so much of choosing, accepting. It just happened. But now I have Master Kirpal as my great love in life, as a spiritual master. And uh, somebody to be accepted <coughs> beside him, I'm not saying his place, because it wasn't, you know, shifting from one master to another, it was adding somebody else, which I could recognize as uh, great as him or let's say that through whom I will get the same kind of grace that I got through him. So this was more of a complicated something, very difficult. So, Master Kepal left the body, I was really suffering a lot and I was so much hoping to find somebody that could bring into my life the same kind of uh, upliftment of consciousness, the same kind of spiritual experiences, the same kind of bliss, the same kind of love, like with him. So, after he died, there were several people who took up the role of a master. Some right away, some after a short while, so the first one that took up the role as a master after he left the body was his son, Darshan Singh. In Italy, uh, the group leader didn't build up <coughs> or didn't uh, bring a good opinion about him. I didn't know Darshan Singh, of course. I saw him why there was a Savanashram with Master Kirpal a few times, but I didn't even look at him, I didn't, uh, let's say, study the person, so I didn't know anything about him. But the opinion that was presented about him, it was uh, negative somehow. It was a fake one, that he wasn't Master Kirpal's successor, that he pretended to be, but he wasn't. So somehow I believed this and I didn't <coughs> consider him as somebody to go see, visit, and he always relate to him, or he relates to me. So, uh, I went on, I waited, kept waiting for something to happen. <coughs> In Italy at the time there was a massacre pass representative who by and by made us understand uh, not very clear terms, but very ambiguous, uh, strange ways, not clear, unclear. 
sometimes telling things one way, then telling things another way. But somehow he made us understand that he was a master. And he was the master. And he was the master of our successor. So, sorry, I liked him as a friend. I liked him as a satsangi. I liked him as a master Kupas representative. I had been attending satsang with him for uh, two years, more or less, every week, twice a week. I was living in Milan at the time, he was also living in Milan. So I knew this person quite well. At least I knew him as far as as far as I was interested in knowing him, not very much on his personal level, but let's say we were good friends. <coughs> I couldn't at all compare him to Master Kripal. I couldn't at all accept him because to me it was like Master Kripal the son and he must star. So, you know, I couldn't compete, couldn't match the, the, the personality of Master Kripal in any way. So I, when it became clear that this was his intention, and this maybe was what he was supposed to do, uh, what he was supposed to do what he wanted to do. Anyway, I left what was Master Kripal Sangha in Italy at the time, and I went my way, looking, keep looking for the person who could relate to me. Then uh, another person came up who was uh, placed in Savanashram as a uh, guru after Master Kripal. Savanashram was the ashram founded by Master Kripal, the very first ashram that he founded in India and where he had his main headquarters anyway. So I went to visit this person. No, I don't want to make so too many names. And there also I was very disappointed. Not so much because of the person whom he was, who was radiated through him, and so on and so forth. But because I couldn't relate to him, that's all. He was not the kind of person that fit with me. I couldn't fall in love with such a person and on uh, the spiritual path, the guru you follow, you have to love otherwise there is no relation. I mean it's not uh, confiding something, but imposes on you to love somebody but it has to be a spontaneous something. So also this person I couldn't take him as my guru, that's all. I couldn't place him again as beside at least my master Kripal couldn't compete with him in my understanding, in my vision of him, in my perception of him. So there also I refused and kept going. But then I was at this point I was very disappointed. Really I thought that I would never get to find somebody in my life to whom I could relate the way I related to Massacre Bar, that I could have the same grace through him or her the same upliftment, the same love, the same spontaneous, natural, loving relation. So it was a very difficult time for me. 1976 was maybe the most difficult year of my life. I became really depressed. I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't hope for getting back that same kind of relation. But eventually, I, uh, the person who was publishing the, the, the Sambani magazine, um, you know, the Satsandesh magazine, it was Masikapas magazine at the time, in America, Russell Perkins, he, he said that he would be publishing another magazine to present to the disciples of Masikapas in the West. Um, Santa Jaib Singh as possible successor to him. So
so somehow this name ringed something inside of me, I think the bell inside of me. I was attracted to the name, to the personality, character that uh, was presented. So anyway, I asked for this magazine. The magazine came after a few months and uh, the words, the message that came through the readings, it really brought um, just what I was waiting for, just, just, just the words of, of this person read from a, from, a, from a magazine. It caused such an upliftment of consciousness inside of me, some, uh, such a wave of grace came upon me that I began feeling alive again for the first time after my Kripa left the body. So I thought if just this is enough to provoke, to cause such a, such a change, such a, such a difference, then meeting him maybe would be fantastic, would be just what I'm looking for. So I made up my mind and in February 1977, along with five other initiates of Master Paul, friends of mine, we went to India and for the first time we went to visit uh, Santa Jaya Singh. Um, I spent a month and a half in India at the time. I went to Rajasthan twice. There were two groups at the Sanjis time. There were groups coming from the west meeting in Delhi and then together going to Rajasthan. So I went with two groups and uh, I spent with him quite some time, like a month or most. And uh, yeah, it happened. What I was looking for, I got that same liking for this man. I like him. He was appealing to me. He was a kind of a character, the kind of personage that uh, I liked because he was so much out of schemes, he was so much out of this modern world, this society, he was living in the tar desert of Rajasthan, he had a very simple ashram made mainly of mud buildings. He was a farmer, very simple man. He was a philosopher, he was a, a graduate in uh, no universities. He was uh, just a very spiritual, holy man. And it was the perception I had of him when I meditated the first time in front of him, with him, on the first visit, on the very first day, that, my God, this is a very holy man. That's, that's how I felt about him. So I liked him, really. And gradually, I, I, it wasn't all of a sudden like the massacre part, but gradually I really fell in love with him. And during this period I spent with him, these two groups and then him coming to Delhi and experiencing also through public satsangs in Delhi, gradually I found my self, my inner self, like a sponge drenched with the fluid love of this person. So when I came back to Italy, my inner self, my mind, my psyche was so much full with uh, the love of this uh, Santa Jaib scene that uh, I would dream of him every night, every time I said the meditation, I had an inner contact with him and it was really wonderful, just as he was wonderful when I met Master Paul. So that's how it happened that I could accept him as Master Kripal's successor. He wasn't easy. I had rebellions also with him at the very beginning, when um, in the first group I, I went, the first 10 days I spent with him, sometimes I really felt like uh, I couldn't follow him, because he knew, anyway he wasn't a different personality, he wasn't Massacre Pal, he was kind of naive, you know, I thought that I would miss somebody that would be just like Massacre Pal, the same person, the same face, the same... Um, ways, the same character, but he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't as beautiful, but different. So at some point, I, I kind of 
kind of thought that no, 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 I can't fall anybody after my, after my sick But even this person, though I like him so much, I cannot accept that's all. So he thought of going away. I thought next day I will uh, go away and go back to Italy and this is all. I will never look for anybody else. Masikipa will be my goal for the rest of my life. But then the next morning something very amazing happened. I went uh, for uh, the morning meditation because I had to <laughs> think and uh, and find out I, how I could leave the place because you know you are in the desert of Rajasthan there is no real road and uh, going back even to Ganganagar the nearest town from which I could get a train go to Delhi and so on and so forth was not so easy so how to do it but anyway since it was there there was morning meditation I decided to attend this morning meditation I went up in this is more room we had meditation with him and the funny thing is that funny interesting thing is that that morning he as soon as I entered into the room he began looking at me and kept looking at me and kept looking at me there were some 20 other people but he almost looked at me the whole time and it's not my imagination because at the end of this sitting most of the people told me how come he was looking at you all the time I don't know how come he was looking at me all the time why he felt like doing it, but he did it. I don't know if you read my mind, if he understood the mental condition in which he was, probably he did, I guess. I'm sure he did. Anyway, he kept looking at me and looking at me, and at some point uh, during this darshan, I felt like a very subtle, but like it was like a breeze entering into me, into my consciousness. And uh, after this, it was like this fresh something entering to me, it exploded inside of me. And uh, my perception of the inner power became so strong, so powerful, that I couldn't almost take it, so powerful it was. So after this meeting, I went out of the room, I went out of the ash, I wanted to be on my own. To, to let this, this uh, experience work inside and uh, manifest what it was supposed to manifest. So I went out of the ashram and I went into a field in which there was a hut that Sanji himself built when he went to live in this place that was his dwelling in the beginning. So from time to time I would go to meditate there because I, strangely enough, always felt a very powerful energy inside there. So I directed myself in that direction, I went there and I sat in meditation and I, ended, I had a wonderful meditation and uh, after this my, <clears throat> let's say, my comparing my sacred power with him as far as the outer personality was concerned, the outer ways were concerned, just finished, I stopped and I didn't do it anymore, I accepted me fully. I understood that uh, my Sadhguru now had taken up this other body. He was working through this other body and I accepted him as my Sadhguru and from then on I never questioned his authority. So that's how I went. <coughs> so as I said, I spent uh, from 25, 26 days with him on three different occasions. It was better and better from the beginning to the end. <clears throat> I had wonderful experiences, sometimes at the end of a day, sometimes at the end of the last satsang of the day, I would go out and uh, just move around and I would be in such a bliss, I would be like, you know, like transported into another plane of consciousness and I would feel the old place to be like really like heaven on earth, that's how I perceived it. And I was so happy because I got back what I wanted. I, the wave of grace that I experienced when I met Master Kapal was with me again, and the love was there, the recognition was there, and the wisdom that I needed 
to find it in a person was very present in this personality. So I was very happy with this. So now, I mean, this is how I accepted him. So how did I relate to him through these 20 long years of association with him? I mean, if I had to recount all the meetings I had with him, it would take days. I went to India every year, attending at least one of his programs in India, one of his retreats, which in the beginning was 10 full days of very intense meditation, satsang, darshan, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, so many beautiful, powerful experiences I had during those retreats, always. I have such a perception of his uh, power, of his grace, of his uh, divine being, that even before I started going to India, even before the trip started, sometimes a week before, sometimes three, four days before, or sometimes the day I started off, I would be like uh, wrapped into such a wave of bliss, wave of grace, intoxication, ecstasy, that uh, it was just amazing. Now when I think back, I wonder how was it possible that I had such a wonderful inner connection with this man. So that's how it was. And every, every retreat I had with him, it was always wonderful. Sitting in front of him, listening to his satsang. It was always like if I was just one person sitting there. Because whatever he said, it was so personal to me that uh, to my special need of the, of the moment, of the period, what I was going through in my life, that it was like if it was just on a personal interview with him, talking to me. But he was talking to everybody, and uh, maybe everybody felt the same or less. I don't know. I can say, or I can speak about myself. To me it was very personal. Whatever he said, I felt it to be just for me, very appropriate, it always, his satsang always cleared up my mind, so wonderfully and uh, it indicated always the right path to continue to proceed in life so that's how it was and this love that i experienced in the beginning kept growing and growing and it was sometimes it was difficult because because of what i was going through life because the happenings of life, because of what I had to learn in that specific period, but I was always very humble with him, I always accepted whatever he told me on a personal level or a general level, I always accepted him, I always obeyed to him, whatever he told me to do, I did it, the way he told me to do it, I did it, I always ask for his uh, opinion, his advice, his order, I would say, because I didn't take him, his words as an opinion. I took his words as the supreme authority of God. That's how I took it. So I always bow down my hand to his advices, to what he told me to do and how to proceed in life. So it was a wonderful experience which lasted 20 years. He came here at this place, I mean, I've, I founded this ashram because, because he was very supportive to this my inclination, to this my idea, to this my project. He encouraged me a lot, he told me do it because that's the good thing for your life, for your spiritual evolution, for your soul. So I went on and on, he came here. He supported me, he not only told me to do things, but he gave me the support at all levels to keep going, to proceed in this, my project. And he came at this ashram on three occasions, hundreds of people came and benefited from his programs. I did a lot of work to organize these programs, myself, together with other satsangis that came and helped. Amazing work, really, so much work, but 
to me it was just ordinary something. Doing seva for my guru was a very pleasant something. Giving my time, my energy, my strength, my abilities for his service, it was just what I wanted to do. So to me it was a blessing. Doing seva for my guru for me was uh, good luck, was grace from God, was a blessing from God, having just the chance of doing it. And uh, <clears throat> he loved me a lot, right from the beginning, he treated me differently, differently than anybody. How can I say this? Just I'll give you an example. In the beginning, especially the, the first programs we had with him, he was asking at the end of meditation, everybody, how is your meditation? Well, how? What did you see inside? What happened to you? He was asking to everybody, one by one. He never asked me. So much at some point, some satsang is complaining, why do you ask everybody and you don't ask Sirio? And he said, should I ask him? Why should I ask him? He showed that he considered me in a different way than everybody else. And I think I liked him a lot and he liked me a lot. I was a very honest, was a very sincere, working hard satsangi coming from Master Kripal. He respected this a lot. He recognized my, let's say, honesty of intention. He saw in me a good sevader, definitely. And he thought to use this sevader for his work. So, when I was 25 years old, he asked me to give initiation in his name. He made me the very first representative in Europe. In the beginning, there was only me for a few years. And I was giving initiation to people coming also from other countries, or me going to other countries to give initiation. <coughs> so, I've been giving initiation since then, since 1977, when I was 25. And I keep giving it. Because I know very well what's initiation and how it's to be given and what happens through initiation and uh, how this phenomenon of transmitting the grace from a master to the seeking person happens. So, what can I say? He has been. Uh, the guru of my life, really. I understand Master Kripal to be my Ishta Deva, as I said already in another video. Like my chosen divinity. Santa Jayab Singh is my Sadhguru. The person that taught me how to be a Satsangi, how to be a real seeker of truth, a true seeker of truth, he shaped my personality, he shaped my mind, he made me what I am through his words, through his example, through his love, through his greatness, through his great personality that impressed me always a lot. It was wonderful when I sat in satsang with him, uh, you know, the whole period that I wouldn't look to anybody, I wouldn't move my eyes from his face, from his eyes, whether he looked at me or not. I was always well focused on his person. And sometimes I saw wonderful things in his body happening. Sometimes I really saw him as Satpurush sitting on his throne while giving satsang. So I had a lot happening with him. I saw wonderful things with him. I experienced wonderful things with him. And I think what I experienced and learned from him, it was enough, enough to make me competent enough to carry on his work, to keep doing what he told me to do, to keep going and uh, becoming, after him, a vessel of grace. Not of my grace, not of my, nothing of mine, but what 
is coming true. Mani to Sadhguru. Sankhya Pal Singh and Santa Jayav Singh. So, this is in general my story with Santa Jayav Singh. I can go into many, many details, but I think for this video, this is enough.